Welcome to our Thought Leader Roundtable focused on confronting escalating cyber attacks on critical infrastructure. I'm Bill Raich, Director of NYU Intercept, and I'm serving as moderator for what promises to be a robust discussion on this urgent challenge. First, I'd like to thank Deloitte for its sponsorship of this forum and the wider initiative. The Deloitte team have contributed greatly to the development of both. I'd also like to thank our co-host for this effort, the NYU Center for Cybersecurity. The center is a tremendous resource for expertise, education, and other capabilities on the cybersecurity challenge, and I encourage all to engage with it. Our agenda today will include a brief overview of our objectives, the introduction of our thought leaders, and then we'll move directly to our roundtable discussion. The overall objectives for this initiative parallel our agenda for our discussion today. First, to better understand the cybersecurity challenge, its drivers and impacts, then to identify actionable strategies and related incentives to address the challenge. We will tee up each of our topical discussions with bullet point summaries of the insights drawn to date from recent interviews with a diversity of thought leaders, including those on the roundtable. We will not discuss these in detail as our roundtable participants have received them in advance. Our viewers are welcome to pause the video to allow them to read and reflect on the summary points. With that as our context, let us welcome our thought leaders. Joining us are Ed Amoroso, Distinguished Professor, NYU, and Chief Executive Officer of TAG Cyber. He also served as the former Chief Security Officer at AT&T. Moira Bergen, Subcommittee Director for Cybersecurity, Infrastructure Protection, and Innovation on the House Committee on Homeland Security. Jesse Goldhammer, Managing Director for the Cyber and Strategic Risk Practice at Deloitte. Bob Kalaski, National Risk Management Center Director at the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. And Jenny Mena, Vice President, Business Security Risk at Humana and former Deputy Chief Information Security Officer at U.S. Bank. Let us now move to our roundtable discussion. Our initial focus is on understanding the drivers and contributing factors to the cybersecurity challenge. We have grouped these insights to date from our interviews into three categories, threats, vulnerabilities, and consequences. Again, our viewers are welcome to pause these slides to view them more closely. Threats identify include nation states and criminals seeking profits. Vulnerabilities include technological, human, and organizational. Consequences include those consequences to bad actors, which have been minimal to date, while consequences to critical infrastructure have evolved over time from minimal, at least in terms of operational impacts, to substantial as of late, with these as an impetus for our forum today. So with that as context, let me pose an initial question to the roundtable. Of the drivers and contributing factors to the cybersecurity challenge that we just outlined, are there any you take issue with or want to explore further? Well, one thing I would call out more strongly, um, and I'm reminded of many years ago when I was going out and doing a series of victim notifications of oil companies that were having issues back when I was at Homeland Security, and we would go and talk to people and they were not even doing basic cyber hygiene. And when we look at even today, so many of these incidents, whether it's ransomware or something else, there is basic cyber hygiene that is missing. I could give the same presentation that I was giving during the Bush administration. And I remember a, a colleague um, who went out with me said, "It's we don't need the advanced persistent threat. You only need to be the adequate persistent threat. Um, we continue to see those basic unpatched vulnerabilities, not doing, you know, kind of normal good practices like multi-factor authentication, things that we know, um, people that are still clicking on those phishing links. And so we talk about all sorts of advanced technology, but so much of it is the human, whether it is the human that chooses not to invest, chooses not to prioritize, um, keep the, the head in the sand a bit, or just doesn't really pay attention to their security training if they never got it. And I think we sometimes go to the hard questions without even looking at those, as I say, you know, in the health sector, that basic hygiene. Well, maybe one way to build on that point, and this might be a source of contention or maybe not, we'll find out. 
One of the things that I think is truly unique about this problem set, just to go even to the back bill to the beginning of kind of all the different drivers and vulnerabilities that you walk through, is the fact that we have nation states that are reaching into our country, uh, sometimes as a nation state, sometimes through criminal networks and doing bad stuff in our country. And we're expecting either private citizens or corporations to defend themselves against nation states that are very well equipped to engage in these kinds of activities. Like historically speaking, that is novel. I mean, it would be you'd be hard pressed to find another time in US history in which foreign nations can just simply reach into our country and do stuff in their national interests um, with mostly the private sector on the hook to deal with those challenges. And I think that a lot of what I heard, I know Bob and Jenny, um, actually, I think everyone, Ed and Moira talk about in their individual sessions was trying to make sense of how to deal with that particular challenge, either through public private partnerships or other kinds of mechanisms. And maybe that's an interesting place to dive in a little bit about where, you know, where some of these disagreements may lie. And I think we will get into definitive strategies um, in that regard in relatively short order. Um, and a very good point. I think there's be a, a very deep conversation around that. Uh, Bob, since we've te teased out the a little bit of the nation state and the, kind of the wider perspective, you at the National Risk Management Center, you're both domestic and international and in where you look. Um, any comments on uh, that or the wider um, uh, litany, if you will, of uh, factors there? Yeah, I, I mean, Jesse, the, I mean, just to have some fun in this conversation, I have some the, the word expecting t deserves to be unpacked a little because certainly my philosophy of the government's role in where we should be in helping drive cyber risk reduction is past the limit of where companies will, will go with rational business decisions and the delta between where we think the threat or, or the risk comes between where companies will go with rational business decisions. In the government, we want to help companies, and we'll talk about incentives, shift maybe what is a rational business decision or, or lower cost to do security, things like that. And, you know, so I'd like to narrow that delta as much as possible, but the government should, in the nation state phase, do something to address the delta. The problem with the word expecting and the problem with what the government does is I don't think anyone here, I guarantee you on the panel, nobody wants the government to take over cybersecurity for private entities, but the government needs to have the back of private entities in cybersecurity and state and local governments in cybersecurity. And so figuring out what having the back means and filling that gap is, you know, what it, Bill, what I spent a lot of my time thinking about, you know, the one other thing I didn't see on the vulnerability list that I think is probably worth talking about is technology, lack of technology modernization, technology refresh and things like that, which contribute to a lot of the underlying things that Jenny's talking about, that, you know, we're, we're just not spending the money on, on technology in a way that we're, we're starting in a better place. Ed, I know you in large part um, had a, a lot of thoughts uh, as we yeah. spoke earlier uh, on really the role of technology and the complexity around that. Um, any thoughts in that respect? Well, first of all, thanks for including me. It's such a nice group, such an um, honor to see everyone here. Um, there are a few things that I think we're getting wrong uh, as, a, as a community around cybersecurity. And I, and I guess in a sense, it's because things have changed so much. The first is that this idea that perhaps we might ask nation states to stop hacking, like as a, as a policy, um, I wish it could be so, uh, but for 40 years, I think we've learned that that's it's never going to work. Um, so I, I have great, great fear that we put too much time and attention to that, asking Putin to stop or something, as if that's going to happen. That's the first problem. The second is that the role of government has shifted. I think Bob alluded to that a little bit. Where in World War II, the government ran the war, ran the front, and we drafted our you know, all of our grandparents and uncles to go fight World War II. Um, now the war is the uh, community banks and, and small organizations and businesses. And government needs to be behind the scenes. Government's not controlling or managing the front anymore. Fundamentally different. Third big difference is that if you ask my parents about attacks on critical infrastructure, they'd point to Pearl Harbor and 9-11 as these things that happen very, very, very occasionally, generationally, 
And the idea that we would have this ongoing stream of attacks on critical infrastructure all, all the time just blows their mind. My mother still doesn't quite know what I do for a living. She doesn't quite understand when I try to explain. The last, I think the most important thing is that we do have the ability to protect ourselves. I'll give you an example. Suppose you were in um, December 6th, you know, 1941, and you knew what was coming the next day. I think there's an old uh, One Step Beyond show where a guy wakes up in, in Hawaii the day before. It's an interesting question. What would you do? Um, you could do some things. You would scatter the planes, evacuate the place. You'd change the infrastructure. With virtualization, you can do that now. We can actually defend ourselves from cyber attacks. The problem is that we do this with people who've underestimated the complexity. Any particular feedback on that? And I'd love more especially to bring, bring you into the equation here. When you think about the um, useful, the utility of uh, basic cyber hygiene, when you've talked about a, a cybersecurity problem and you've, you've talked about it in a very complicated way, and then you say, but you could buy down your risk with complicated passwords, multi-factor authentication, and basic cyber hygiene, people might not believe you because they've been sort of sold this, this, uh, this, this case that it's a very complicated problem to solve. And they might not think that the basic cyber um, practice, cyber hygiene practices will, will have much um, utility. I think another place where there has been um, a missed opportunity is aligning what the government can do well with what the private sector needs from the government. And I think you, what we end up having is the government and the private sector talking past each other because you have the government saying what it wants to do, what it thinks it should bring to the table. The private sector saying, well, we want this type of support from the government, but maybe not articulating it in a way that the government knows what it wants to deliver. Um, and and maybe the government and private sector not really understanding what the government's going to be able to deliver right now and then what it can build to deliver. And I think there needs to be a greater understanding of the needs of the private sector and of what the government is in the position to deliver. And I think we're making progress on that now, but I think that progress has come really slowly and that has, um, we've lost some time there. And then finally, I will just close out with, um, there have been uh, it's been it's been a long time coming to clarify roles and responsibilities across what the uh, across the federal government. So who's responsible for planning? Who's responsible for incident response? Who's responsible for day to day directives on what critical infrastructure sectors should be doing to secure their networks? Um, there have been turf wars in Congress, turf wars among agencies. I think there are efforts like underway to to clarify that now. But I think the um, the, the delay in making those roles and responsibilities more concrete so the private sector knows who to engage with within the government and who's responsible for what, I think that has um, stunted our progress also. Maura, if we could use one of the points you just made there, I know we've had some sidebar conversations on this, but that issue of really aligning government capabilities with private sector needs, maybe a quick round robin uh, reflecting on, uh, maybe we start with Jenny, you know, you've been on both sides of the house, relative to past policies and efforts around public-private, um, you know, if you will, interplay in that regard, uh, where do you see opportunities for improvement maybe? Well, I think we've had some places where there's been tremendous success that have not always been continued or replicated. I think some of those successes work in a limited area and are very difficult to scale. Um, and so we, I hear a lot about the private sector, the private, it's kind of like saying women feel this way. And like, there's one opinion, right? The private sector ranges from massive, you know, multinational corporations that have thousands of people in their information security organization, half of which just came from Fort Meade or DHS or another government agency and, and have a lot of money and a lot of sophistication, sharing information with like-minded, similarly sophisticated companies. What those companies like big banks need is very different from what a small business needs um, and requires a different kind of engagement, probably a different place where they interact, but also recognizing that all of the industries are different. And so what works in the financial sector may not work in the health sector or in the defense industrial base um, or, or down the line. And I think that's one of the challenges that DHS has faced where DHS is supposed to be everything to everybody um, with a relatively small number of people and right, you can't please all the people all the time. 
Um, so I think the government needs to look at just like if they were a business, what are the areas that they have that are unique market differentiators? What does the government have that nobody else does? I would say, you know, NSA, signals intelligence capabilities. CIA also has great intelligence capabilities. Law enforcement, right? You guys can go arrest people. Um, we can't. We also have a military, right? And, and a State Department that can demarche, that can do all sorts of other diplomatic things. So using that whole suite of uniquely government capabilities um, to support us and let private sector, enable private sector to do the things that private sector can do, but also recognize that we're not a monolith and there's gotta be a way to segment into, you know, relationship managers, whether they're individual agencies, parts of a different department, um, you know, to provide what they have to the right people. Good points. Ed, if you were in, you know, short order to, you know, reflect on, you know, past, uh, if you will, uh, successes and failures and opportunities for improvement, importantly, on sort of that interplay uh, with, between government and private sector. Well, first of all, I tip my cap to Bob and Moira. That's a tough job. You take a lot of grief. And it's just really not easy being in government. Um, so I want to preface by saying that, again, I have the greatest respect for people who are working in that area. But we're failing miserably, and the Russian, Chinese hackers can do anything they want, more or less. Um, and we have one serious attack after another. Government is not the answer. The government needs to be supportive. The government needs to be a resource. The government needs to be encouraging computer science education. But the answer is not going to come from government policy. These are infrastructure problems. They're issues that stem from bad design. Look, I'm very hopeful that with SaaS, with cloud, with virtualization, with software-defined infrastructure, with zero trust, that these themes are good ones. And I have a feeling that next generation infrastructure built by young people, our children, who speak technology without an accent, um, I think it's going to be better. I would argue, and I've served on the board of a large Fortune 500 bank, I'd say the average intern working in a large bank knows more about cybersecurity than the CEO and all the whole entire board combined. So I think that there's some generational sort of tailwind. Things will get better because they'll be designed better. Think Google, think about Beyond Corp and the way Google has designed their infrastructure. You don't read about a lot of hacks to Google lately uh, because they've completely redesigned things. I think that's the answer, not government assistance. Let, let's build on that positive note. Uh, Jesse, uh, your thoughts. And I'm going to end with Bob on this one since it's sort of in his bailiwick as well. Sure. And I think maybe, and I think we might have actually found a, a point of disagreement. So let me see if I can flesh this out a little bit. So um, let's just start with a little, like a historical analogy. Early part of the 20th century, Americans were arguing that the government had no role in food safety. And then you have, you know, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, and all of a sudden, Department of Agriculture has a role in like meatpacking plants in places like Chicago. Or fast forward to the 1960s, and you have Americans who are saying like government has no role in transportation safety and car safety in particular. And then you get someone like Ralph Nader who writes, you know, unsafe at any speed, and we get the Department of Transportation. Um, you can make the same same analogy also with um, environmental policy and the EPA. What I don't understand is why government shouldn't have a role in setting standards for products and services to make sure that when, whether it's a, this is to Jenny's point, whether it's, you know, a sole business owner or a small business buying services or buying products where they don't have any cybersecurity knowledge and they shouldn't have to, but they should be buying products and services that, that are generally considered to be secure, just like when we go buy a car we are buying a, a complex piece of technology that we generally know to be secure up to standards that, you know, politically speaking, we consider to be reasonable. I think that is exactly the role that government should play. And I think that role is going to look different for small businesses than it will for multinational corporations. But there is, I think, a strong role for government to play so that we can get Americans out of the business of trying to decide what is safe or what is secure or what is not. The last thing I'd say about this, and I think folks have heard me make this argument. Um, I think we should get out of the business of thinking about this as a security problem and we should talk about it as a safety problem, like cyber safety, a little bit like occupational safety, a little bit like food safety or environmental safety. And then I think that actually gets to Moira's point about how to 
simplify how we talk about this with policymakers or maybe even CEOs, because I think safety is a lot easier to understand than technical complexities around security. Thanks, Jesse. And I'm going to uh, remind you, we're going to get into the tactical side or strategy side in the next session, but those are all great things to build on. Bob, If in terms yeah. of final reflection on really um, opportunities for improvement around public-private? So let, let me start by thanking Moira and, and, and the committee she works on, because the, that, that committee clearly thinks that the government has a role in dealing with the the cybersecurity challenges that we're talking about. It, and Moira and her colleagues helped write laws that established the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. And, and, and as you know, and I'm being a little bit flippant, but but we do have a role there. To, to your question, Bill, it, and I fundamentally believe it, the more I listen to what the private sector needs, the better we are at playing that role. And we have to be humble. I do agree with Ed in terms of humility, in terms of what the government can bring that is beneficial to different settings and, you know, looping back everyone here, J Jenny talking about, you know, the value proposition we bring to help state and local election officials is different than the value proposition we bring to, to help banks. And we need to design our support with, with that in mind. And sometimes government's support is around things that are actually getting out of the way of, of, of breaking things getting things out of the way that are actually going to enable solutions. So, so lack of government activity can also be, be an effective thing. So, so that's kind of how I think about, about um, this. You know, public-private partnerships is a hackneyed term at times, but what it should mean is regular dialogue around a shared challenge and taking advantage of knowledge, skills, and capabilities from different organizations and putting those toward a shared national effort. And, and that's really the, what the word partnership means there. It's that I bring different things than somebody else and, and I, I might have different different responsibilities in terms of dealing with the risk than somebody else. But if we can, can combine that, then we can achieve the thing that ultimately we're trying to achieve, which Jesse, I think it's not safety as much as it's resilience or continuity of us being able to function and do the things that we believe are most important to our communities and our well-being and our economy and our country. And if we think about the cyber challenge as not breaking those things that are most important, and that's what I hope every business is doing, and I think I talked about this in my remarks, you know, protect the things that are most essential to your business and put the money there. The government needs to help protect the things that are most essential to our well-being as a country. We call those critical functions, and we're working very hard to define what those are and to demonstrate that, that we can put we, the right amount of effort to protect those critical functions. Okay, I'm going to suggest at this point in time that um, there is significant consensus on much of this. There may be some differences in terms of degree, especially with regard to the role of uh, of government, if I can uh, uh, call that out uh, and the like. But I think um, uh, beyond that, I think, uh, you know, again, I, I welcome you all, anyone to speak up at this point in time, if there's any other major points of differences that uh, we should call out? Well, I can, I can again, I, I mean, what, what I'm hearing from Jesse, Bob, and Moira, and Jenny are all reasonable. I mean, that's why we've had these beliefs since Dick Clark, you know, basically wrote PDD 63. I remember helping him. He's still a very close friend of mine. Um, for 40 years, we've tried to do public-private partnership, and we've, I've come to the conclusion that it doesn't work, that this idea that, you know, we, we'd simplify, for example. Like, I'll give you an example, but when, when you're in a meeting and there's something hard that pops up, and let's say you're in that meeting, you don't understand it. You know that feeling you have to trickle down the back of your neck and you think, oh my God, I don't even know what they're talking about. This is really complicated. It's a terrible feeling. And you're praying for the meeting to end. And when it's end, you run and you go try and rectify that understanding. Um, I think when we simplify cybersecurity, we deny Congress members and others that moment of terror where they should understand that this is not easy. This is a very hard problem. I also think, and have learned in 40 years of doing this, that this idea that simple stuff, like we do these basics and that will cover most of it, that's like a fence that has a thousand holes and somebody climbs through this one, and we go, let's go fix that one. It's the biggest one. That's where everybody tends to go through. So if we could just stop that, we'll stop most of the attacks. That's not been my experience. My experience is the attackers you really worry about, we'll go take one of the other holes. We have underestimated how big a problem this is. I believe that this problem is as big as climate change. I think that the kinds of issues that emerge here 
are big enough that require really, really massive heavy lifting by experts. Okay, let's build on these insights so far and formally move our focus to actionable strategies and related incentives. I will note that we've already touched on a number of these. Let's look initially to discuss internally focused strategies for the private sector. The insights you see run from assuring cybersecurity as a C-level board level priority to advancing a zero trust architecture approach. Maura, can you lead in with your thoughts? Um, yeah, so I mean, I think um, the, the biggest point I would make is on the um, communication to the consequences. And I know this is another, Jenny, I just really liked your, your, your individual uh, statement, um, but really being able to communicate the consequences of cyber, cyber events and the um, benefits and cost savings of in, uh, both to the brand and to the um, uh, cost of doing business on investing early in cybersecurity. Um, instead of waiting for events to to happen, um, and sort of staying on the uh, staying on the front end of of the discussion there, I think that's that's the the biggest the biggest piece. I think from a policy you know perspective, the question we always have um, as policymakers is how do we drive that policy? How do we drive people to embrace zero trust? Number one, how do we incentivize? people to implement it. And two, how do we know that it means the same thing to different people? So we can talk a lot about zero trust, but there's not really a, con there's not a general consensus of what that means and what you have to have implemented to have achieved zero trust. And then secondly, how do we drive people to um, implement those practices in the first place? And once we've incentivized it, how do we make sure it's auditable if we're going to give some kind of incentive, if we're going to give a tax incentive, or if we're going to give um, a people love to talk about liability protection, which is a bit of a third rail where in, in my world, but um, how would you how would you audit and validate that people have implemented the types of security protections that we want them to? And I think one of the places where um, you know policymakers uh, get a little frustrated is we talk a lot about what people should be doing and what people can be doing, but how do we get people to actually do it? And you you'll hear um, and very fairly that there are different sectors that have different levels of maturity um, and that have different levels of of need um, when it comes to what kinds of security um, uh, they need to be implementing. But how do we strike the right chord in and making sure that we have the right expectations of the right sectors? And then how do we make sure that people are implementing the practices we want them to implement? And how do we make sure they're implemented correctly in a way that when, when we're told we implemented the NIST framework or we implemented zero trust, that it actually means what we think it means. Thank and, and I think we, we do have a section specifically focused on, if you will, incentives and motivations. Uh, cognizant of, of a lot of the material we wanna cover here, um, I'm going to suggest maybe we uh, additionally, we're looking at the private sector side of the house. Uh, Jenny or Jesse, uh, ir uh, do either of you have any uh, comments you want to uh, weigh in on in terms of, you know, either consensus items or challenges that you see to some of these uh, listed here? Too quickly for me, I would just suggest, especially for these internally focused strategies, one, get rid of your legacy hardware and software if you can. That's where to make investments. That stuff is the most insecure. It's often the hardest to manage going forward because it's you know end of life, end of service, which means it can't be patched. So it's a great place to really reduce risk. And the other one is get leverage from really large corporations that are providing IT compute and security services that you can't provide yourself. So there's a huge, it's not to say that you know, if you're doing, if you're migrating to the cloud, that all of your security is managed by those cloud service providers, but a lot of it is, and it's often way more secure than what you can do on-prem. So there's a way, I think, to get leverage from existing IT service providers, especially for cloud, which, which can also help you manage your risk. Any wider discussions on this before we focus on sort of external engagement for the private sector? I mean, I think it's a good list. The one thing that I see that's missing here, if I was advising a, a company, is where is the being prepared for a bad day? The, the business continuity, ability to roll back offline backups, exercises, you know, having your incident response contractor and your outside counsel lined up. I think that's so critical where even if you have the best intent and think you've done everything on this list, 
sometimes you haven't, and sometimes there's a more sophisticated bad guy that has come after you. Jenny, I certainly agree that the business continuity and resilience focus is a critical one to acknowledge. Let's move now to the externally focused strategies for the private sector. As you see here, call outs ran from the consideration of cybersecurity in all external relationships, including suppliers, partners, customers, et cetera, to the development of mutual aid relationships, which is being pioneered currently in the electricity sector. Ed, your perspectives on the external focus? Well, certainly. I think when you talk about external in the context of government, um, I think uh, Jenny might have said that, you know, saying government's like saying something about, you know, well, well it's it's too broad. Like um, I had the opportunity to work on the NSA advisory board for a while. It's a place knows cybersecurity pretty well. I grew up on Fort Monmouth. My dad was 35 years in the government as a research scientist. The DOD knows something about it. And I, I became friendly with Chris Krebs and now Jen and the CISA is a good agency, they know. But there's a big drop off after that. I mean, when you're talking about civilian agencies, they're amongst the most poorly protected um, organizations I've ever seen in the world. And we talk zero trust and also use Einstein to protect them, it's you know, oil and water. They're just not the same thing. So, so government is, and then to get state and local, it's even even worse. So, so there really is a very, very wide swath of capability in government, and I think that there are some places that know what they're doing. I think DHS has gotten really much better, and if anybody's going to be interacting externally with the private sector, it should be those good agencies. But the civilian agencies, I think, have not. Um, have not done a good job. And, and we will touch directly on the, on the governmental uh, in short order. Uh, Bob, you in, have really voiced the fact that in, you're looking at that delta, if you will. You're not only there uh, in terms of your uh, CISA role to really support the uh, individual corporation itself, but also looking at issues of national security and the delta between the two. Um, what's your perspective on this uh, kind of external focus on private sector strategies? Yeah, a couple, of, you know, a thing I didn't see on the list, which which maybe didn't come up, which is interesting, is cyber insurance. And cyber insurance is a driver toward better security because there are economic incentives for insurance rates and what gets insured and things like that. And, you know, my, my understanding of the cyber insurance market is it, you know, it's largely been a risk transfer market for the most part and, and not a driver of real risk mitigation. But but I, I hope that isn't the end of where the cyber insurance market Leaves and, and you know as, as we talk to some of the cyber insurance companies, right? They they want to help be the drivers for change within who they're insured, or at least that's what they tell us. And, and you know, I'm listening to the private sector, so so we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, but but that's something that it, it's interesting thinking about how insurance incentives can, can change some of the, the existing risk. You know, the one I emphasize a lot on the external side, which is picked up, is, is know your suppliers, care about your suppliers, or the information communication technology. Buy stuff that is more likely to be trustworthy from, from the get-go and, and put in place things in your contract so that you can do the, the famous verify after, tr you know, trust but verify, to quote Reagan, right? And, and so we, we want to make sure that, you know, using purchasing power to bet, buy better stuff gets us in a better situation. You know, that that's again an area where I think government can help if we use our purchasing power more effectively. And that's what the president's executive order really post solar winds was trying to do, say, hey, we are going to be better buyers of software. We're gonna be we're gonna put higher standards on software. And because of that, that's gonna benefit the overall system. That's an important um, role. And we're gonna we'll touch on that briefly, but if I could maybe end on this question since uh, you know, really, Bob, um, again, your critical role in the National Risk Management Center there. W what else, if you will, or what would be your um, any uh, particular focus in terms of additional um, either information or other resources from the private sector to enable your support role? What, were there any um, gaps there that you'd like or perhaps elements of just, you know, greater degree that you'd like to see? Yeah, I mean, I think what we'd like is more assurance of what's being done by things that are, that are systemically critical and more sharing of information both ways around that. And, and so, you know, some of the pending or potential legislation coming out of, of, of some of the observations this year are more incident reporting, incident reporting in different formats, but maybe, 
you know, I, I like the idea of a, the Salarium Commission of a Bureau of Cyber Statistics, and if we can take data and we can create better information like that and, and use statistics, I'll have a better sense of risk. We can talk in terms, communicate in terms of risk, the kind of ideas that, that we've been talking about here. So I think more incident reporting, more information sharing, and then again, uh, on things that, that we really think have systemic importance to national security, you know, the ability to have trust that good cyber practices have been, have been put in place there. And if we, we don't have visibility in that, or if we don't think they're, if we can't trust the cyber practices in there, the ability to go in and, and help sh do something about that. Why don't we, uh, first of all, I'll leave it for any, any additional comments before we move on to the governmental perspective. Um, any um, folks want to weigh in on any additional comments that way? I mean, just one quick point I'd make, Bill, which is uh, just building on Bob's point. I, I think we probably need to better understand what the disincentives are for information sharing, especially either between private sector entities or between the private sector and the government. Um, we, we talk a lot about the importance of doing it. Uh, there certainly is a lot of it happening, but my sense is the vast amount of data that the private sector owns, especially threat data, which would be a huge benefit to the government in terms of better understanding what threats are out there and how to mitigate those threats, that that data is not really aggregated or shared in any, you know, in, in any comprehensive way. And the incentives, my, my, my suspicion is the incentives are all very complicated uh, and, and need to be sorted out in a way that makes it easier for folks to share large amounts of information in near real time. Jesse, I agree most definitely that wider data sharing in the private sector holds great promise and is worthwhile exploring rigorously. Let's move the formal focus of our discussion now to government although clearly we've already discussed much in this domain already. While there are wider insights to be introduced, let's initially discuss two lenses, strategic and external engagement in the government domain. Strategic insights ran from developing truly systemic solutions, which Bob, you've advocated for, to also a call out not to victim shame. Government external engagement insights ran from a call to prioritize national critical functions to getting better at collecting information. Bob Kalaski, can I ask you to lead off with your thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, Bill, one of the things about systemic solutions is, is I think it's it's a little bit of the, long, the lines of what Jesse was talking about, is look at where there's leverage for entities to get more secure that aren't all, doesn't depend on each entity improving their own game and managing their own problems and the underlying technologies associated business incentives. There are things that can, you know, even even the way that, that stuff is governed, there are things that will change the fundamental nature of risk through systemic change that then will make the network defender be in better shape um, to deal with the problems they face. And, and that that's the stuff that, again, you know, tying this all together, you know, really looking for those big muscle movements that change the nature of where we are along the lines of it. it's, it's generational type things and putting in place the ability to, to push for those and understanding why they're not happening. Um, you know, continuing education and continuing building up the talent that serves on this mission will only help. And, you know, that's one reason that, you know, we're, we're excited about where CISA is and, and what, where we want to take CISA is we want to be a place that can be really a center of excellence to attract the kind of talent that we need to deal with these widespread 21st century challenges. And I don't think, you know, I, I don't think where we were five years ago, we, we had the same reach into the kind of talent base that the government's gonna need to, to add value here. And, and I think now we do, and, you know, listening to my new boss, Jen Easterly, you know, that's gonna be one of her big drivers over the next couple of years, bringing more talent into to help with this national security challenge. Ed, I know you've been a big advocate in that regard. Do you wanna to touch base on that? Well, I think that's the number one thing. I think the talent gap right now is akin to the kind of problems we had with the Industrial Revolution. You know, we just didn't have the right types of people to do the things that are necessary. And I, I think to deal with that, we focused on three things that I think are, are unfortunately wrong. And I, I remember believing in my heart that they were right. Like the first was that if you follow a framework, you can stop cyber attacks. And I wish that was true. You know, I wanted it to be true. I grew up in the orange book days, for heaven's sake. So, but it's not. 
And, and, and the second I issue is that information sharing, which was so critical, the uh, ISACs that were designed in the 1990s, you know, I dreamed and hoped that that would work. And I, and I dreamed and hoped that maybe even regula regulation and fines would work. None of them have worked in 30 years. So it's like when you're a carpenter, everything looks like a nail, you know, those are three things that people can understand, sharing information, reg, <laughs> finding you none of them work the things that work are hard having you know a more skilled capability doing fundamental redesign having tools that are significantly more capable scattering infrastructure distributing and virtualizing workloads these are hard and they require a lot of skill to do it's hard to explain that to a board member but that is the solution and I think that, you know, moving forward, this is a technical problem and it's always non-technical people saying cybersecurity is this management or some other thing. It's not, it's a technical problem. These are cybersecurity attacks that occur on networks, to software, on infrastructure, on, on computing infrastructure. That's where the problem is. And if we can fix it, then I think that we'll see something akin to bank robbery type risk where, you know, you'll still have the problem, but when was the last time we sat and worried about bank robbery? Because we use technology to fix that problem, not banks sharing information in real time about bank robbers. We fix the technology. So that's what needs to happen. All good points. Moira, um, certainly the um, Homeland Security Committee is, is at the center of much of this uh, really development uh, on the governmental side as of late and, and certainly championing a lot of legislation, empowering legislation. Your thoughts, uh, particularly on the governmental role in this case? Yeah, I, I guess I would start by, you know, acknowledging that there's no silver bullet solution. And I think that's a consensus item that I've heard is um, no one policy, no one program, um, no one tool is going to um, completely buy down or eliminate cyber risk. And I think we all are working with that understanding that it's going to be a series of policies and a series of different types of investment that buys that down. Um, I, I absolutely agree that we need a um, better workforce, a stronger workforce, and that we need to cultivate people from an early age to um, to enter cybersecurity workforce. And I think we also need to cross train people. Um, so it can't be that you're, um, we, we leave cybersecurity to cybersecurity folks, but rather we cross train people who are involved in um, the, the utility business, in the telecom business, um, um, even financial services, uh, need healthcare, we all need to be cross trained to understand the intersection um, with cybersecurity and, and what your job is. But I think more broadly, um, the government has an obligation to lead by example. And that means if we're gonna tell people they need to get rid of their legacy technology, we need to get rid of ours. And certainly it's costing us an arm and a leg to secure the legacy systems that are still operating in federal networks. So if if we're gonna tell um, a, a private sector company, whether it's their IT systems or their OT systems, that they need to be updated so they can be secured and they should eliminate legacy technology. We need to do the same thing at the federal level and lead by example. Um, and, and I think when we when we make that kind of commitment and we make the kind of commitment to buy secure technologies ourselves, that will help um, market incentives and that will, that will similarly drive down risk. Um, and I think um, since so, so we need to empower, but it's also empowering its partner agencies. And I think this is a point made earlier that um, yes, CISA plays an, an important central hub role, but the sector risk management agencies play an important role in driving down risk too. And that those agencies need to be funded and, and um, staffed to be able to carry out those, their responsibilities effectively also. So I think um, mm -hmm. collective solutions are really what we're gonna have to pursue. Okay, let's at least formally introduce other dimensions of government, although we've touched on a number of these already. These include deterrence, which Jenny, you laid out in large part earlier, requirements, which included proposing minimum software and hardware standards, which Jesse, clearly you advocate for, and wider societal strategies, including a focus on the individual, which you called out, Moira, and education, which many, if not all of you, have advocated for, especially Ed. And finally, incentives, which have been referenced in a number of contexts already, 
including purchasing requirements. Bob, you're an advocate for incentives. Can you lead in with your thoughts? I mean, I, you know, in, in, I'm a big fan of incentives, but incentives are a lot of different policy levers that, that have to be thought thought of differently. But, but you, you know, you, you hear me talk about this all the time. If you change the bis business calculus, we, we start in a much better place. And incentives are basically a, a method by which you change the business calculus. Incentives can be carrots and sticks, of course, but, but it will change some nature of the business calculus, which will do what I want, reduce the delta, and, and then let the government focus on areas where the government can be most effective. Great. And Jesse, I know you've advocated in large part for this idea of, of you know, core requirements, uh, really uh, use, uh, again, leveraging the idea of safety distinct from security. Um, any final comments relative to the role of uh, core standards? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, what I'd love to do is get most Americans out of the business of trying to figure out whether the hardware or software that they're buying has the appropriate encryption standards in it or whether it's been you know, properly secured for doing wireless connection. To, to build on Ed's point earlier, like these are fundamentally technical challenges and we should be training and incenting people to learn these skills, to be able to use them in the public and private sectors. But ultimately, I think it is the role of government to help us get out of the business of trying to make those judgments. Our, our, our products and our services should inherently be secure, just as I'm a little neurotic about these things. But like when I go to the store, I don't really worry about food safety. When I go buy a car, I don't actually worry whether the car is safe or not. Uh, when I go into an office building, typically I assume that it's relatively safe for me to work in. Now, there are obviously exceptions to all those rules, but that should be the same for cybersecurity. Jenny, you've had a foot on both sides of the, uh, the if you will, the fence, the government, uh, as well as the private sector, uh, being on the private sector side now. Yeah. If you had a kind of a final call out in all this, what would it be? Um, I truly don't believe there is a single solution. I agree with Ed that we need better technology to be available to solve the problem, but the technology won't be implemented in a company unless the business leader or the board um, agrees to make the investment to buy it. Um, you know, similarly, there there is no single solution for every company or single government agency that can solve this. This is really something where we need a lot of different pieces to come together. And because the landscape keeps changing, we're gonna need to continue iterating and iterating and iterating on this because as we fix things, the bad guys are just gonna keep iterating and improving on their side. Ed, um, a minute or two on really what you would kind of leave in terms of final call out on this. Well, the skills gap is number one. I spend most of my time now when I'm not teaching, working with enterprise teams, and they don't, they're not equipped or capable enough to deal with the Chinese military. It's just an unfair fight. So we really need to rethink, you know, the incentives for young people to go into computing, to get into technical disciplines, and to learn cybersecurity. I think that would be my number one uh, wish. And Moira. Um, again, you sit in the Homeland Security Committee perspective, um, your call out really for, uh, for the most, if you will, highly prioritized action. I think uh, from where I sit, I think we need to continue to clarify who is responsible for what and what we expect of government and what we expect of different critical infrastructure owners and operators and what we expect the government to be able to do. I mean, we talked earlier to kind of bring it full circle do we, can we really expect a private sector entity to defend themselves about against Russia, China, big cyber, big sophisticated threat actors? We, we can't, but what's, you know, figuring out what role the government is best equipped to play, what, what, what the, the private sector is not able to do on its own, a gap it's not able to fill. And even if the government can't do it today, how do we build that capacity so the government can deliver that service at some point in the near future? Because that's what we we got to fill we got to fill gaps here, um, and so I, th I think that's the um, biggest takeaway. And I think to Jenny's point, it's about continuing the conversation and understanding that it will need to refresh regularly, um, and that uh, today's solution might not be tomorrow's solution. And we have to be willing to accept that what we what we implemented you know, 10 years ago might have been the solution for 10 years ago, but because the environment has changed, we might need to evolve and we need to be okay with that. How would you ultimately 
continue that conversation in your regard, regard in terms of really engaging your informing, you know, legislative initiatives going forward? Is there any particular, you know, we have a number of collaborative efforts uh, already out there, but is there anything new that you'd recommend? You know, I think um, the biggest challenge so far is what drives change, and this is in any particular um, policy area, it's not, I don't think it's limited to cyber, um, is that it tends to be crisis driven. And we um, manage a crisis or we think we manage a crisis and then we put the issue on hold and we don't have a sustained engagement on the issue. I think you know, we, the best, most recent example of that, it's outside of cyber in the exclusive way is elections. You know, we dealt with HAVA in 2004, then we put it on the back burner, and then we our hair was on fire in 2016. So how do we keep cyber as an ongoing discussion? Um, I think we'll take uh, concerted effort on behalf of interested parties and the the desire to continue to make progress and build policy. Certainly Congress can keep conversations going by, um, you know, thinking about legislating, and that certainly brings people to the table, particularly when you're going to make changes that are significant. Um, but I think it's going to take leadership at the highest levels of government continuing to convene people. And I want to give a shout out to CISA, because I think particularly Bob Shop does an excellent job bringing people together to continue important conversations about um, risk management. And so I think the government taking on that role, um, the, the convening role and the, the role of um, continuing those conversations can be an important one. And I think I, uh, this has been a great conversation. I want to sincerely thank each of you for sharing the insights. I know we had a tremendous amount of, perhaps too much, uh, in the way of, of insights to share. Uh, sincere thanks really for helping, you know, really distill some of them a little bit more, amplifying in some cases. Going forward, our initiative will focus on continuing this conversation, maybe in large, in small way, um, you know, playing some of that role that uh, Moira, you laid out there and, and perhaps supporting some of the good efforts that uh, other elements of gar uh, government and CISA and other uh, entities are doing. Uh, we will continue to engage subject matter experts. Um, we will get uh, many of your insights out there. Uh, likely there will be uh, additional um, discussions such as these round tables as we go forward. We welcome input from each of you in terms of how we can um, be of help uh, as we go forward. Uh, in closing, again, sincere thanks to you. Sincere thanks for the support we got from uh, Deloitte and the great team uh, that provided many of the insights in pulling this together. Um, and uh, we thank, of course, our, uh, our joint center here at NYU, uh, uh, the NYU Center for Cybersecurity. Um, sincere thanks. Thanks for your time and um, look forward to hopefully continuing the conversation.